World Unity Week, leading us to this moment as we begin a new day with an extraordinary premiere, uh, an incredible conversation between two global leaders, um, Miss Audrey Kitagawa and David Corton. And today, uh, we're going to be seeing the world premiere. We're so grateful uh, to the International Academy of Multi uh, Multicultural Cooperation um, for giving us this world premiere of the, of the film For the Love of Life, Finding Our Way to an Ecological Civilization with Audrey Kitagawa and David Corton. It's so exciting. Can't wait to see this film. Let me just tell you uh, a few lines about our principal speakers today. Uh, Audrey Kitagawa is the president and founder of the International Academy for Multicultural Cooperation, president of the Light of Awareness International Spiritual Family, chair of the Anti-Racism Initiative and co-chair of the Gender Equality Working Group of the G20 Interfaith Forum, uh, and the former advisor to the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General uh, for Children and Armed Conflict at the United Nations. I can tell you, Audrey has got a huge, long list of accomplishments uh, and achievements. Um, it's just so wonderful to have you back, uh, Audrey, in World Unity Week. And thank you once again. The International Academy for Multicultural Cooperation is a, a co-sponsor uh, of this platform in World Unity Week. And we're so excited, Audrey, to have you back. Um, I want to just say a few words about your fellow speaker, David Corton, is an author, lecturer, engaged, engaged citizen, student of psychology and behavioral systems, a prominent critic of corporate globalization, and an advocate of ecological civilization. He's earned an MBA uh, and a PhD degrees from the Stanford Working Graduate School of Business, served on the uh, faculties uh, of the Harvard Business School and Harvard School of Public Health, and worked for 30 years in international development in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. He is founder and president of the Living Economies Forum, an active member of the Club of Rome, a member of the International Advisory Council of the International Academy for Multicultural Cooperation, and an ambassador of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, co-founder and board chair uh, emeritus of Yes Magazine, and is the author of numerous influential books, including the international best-selling books, When Corporations Rule the World and the Great Turning from Empire to Earth Community. Again, David has got a long list of accomplishments and achievements, but it's incredible to have such uh, incredible, extraordinary speakers coming to World Unity Week with this beautiful program and this premiere movie for the love of life. And how perfect, Audrey, that we would have this on a day dedicated to abundance. So welcome to you, Miss Audrey Kitagawa from the International Academy for Multicultural Cooperation. It's so wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much and good morning everyone from New York City and I wish to extend my deepest appreciation to you Ben Bowler for your incredible Unity Earth team, co-sponsors and dedicated volunteers who make this annual World Unity Week platform freely available to all of us. And if you want to check your chat box, there's more detailed information about the biographies. So Ben has really been instrumental in creating a civil society movement that draws people from all sectors around the world. And it signifies the great coming together in a multitude of expressions, which demonstrates the rich interweaving tapestry of our lives with the global family that is really hungry to be brought together in unity, cooperation, and joy. Today, the International Academy for Multicultural Cooperation is pleased to present the world premiere of a short film which it created entitled For the Love of Life, Finding Our Way to an Ecological Civilization. This film is a fascinating look at the life and work of best-selling author, economist, and visionary David Corton. We are honored to have Dr. Corton with us today to have further conversation with me, answer questions, and share his further thoughts and ideas. So please stay tuned after the film is shown. So now may we please enjoy the film. Welcome everyone. My name is Audrey Kitagawa, and I am the founder and president of the International Academy for Multicultural Cooperation. 
It is such a privilege to introduce Dr. David Corton, an influential prophetic voice for civilizational transformation. Dr. Corton will take us on an intriguing journey from a small town in the Northwestern United States to distant lands and share how he arrived at his distinctive insights about the well being of mankind. Dr. Corton now advocates for deep transformation to bring forth a new civilization devoted to the love of life to replace the pseudo civilization devoted to the love of money. Family, community, and nature frame much of my early years. All are defining themes of an ecological civilization grounded in a recognition of the interdependence of life on which a viable human future depends. My dad devoted his life to building a successful small town business that served the community in which I grew up. And it's interesting, he loved making money and some might think of him as a dedicated capitalist, but he lived by a mantra that he often repeated, one rarely associated with capitalism as we now know it. If you are not in business to serve your customers, you have no business being in business. His customers and the community in which we lived were one and the same, and he served them both in a great many ways. I remember a night many years ago, it was after business hours, his store was closed. We were sitting at our dinner table as a family enjoying the meal together. The phone rang. It was a call from a customer, a guitar player with a local gig that night. He had lost his guitar pick. That's an item that back then might have sold for maybe five cents. Dad got up from dinner, he drove to the store he got his customer a guitar pick, and he returned home to finish his by then cold dinner. He was very successful, but his business model was not about maximizing profit. It was about maximizing service to our community. In return, the business provided our family with a comfortable middle-class lifestyle. So I learned in my youth that profit is essential for a business to survive but money is not a proper purpose for a business or a life. And a competition to excel in serving your community is very different from competing to make money at the expense of your neighbor. That's what my dad taught me. I grew up with conservative political views and was deeply fearful of the communist revolutions then sweeping the world. To my eyes, they presented a mortal threat to the middle-class American way of life that I so loved. These revolutions were not a defining issue for me at the time, but they were at the back of my mind as I was preparing in college to run the family business. To graduate with a BA degree, Stanford required students to take a two-unit course outside their major. One caught my eye. It was on modern revolutions. I learned that contemporary revolutions are driven by the hardships of poverty in a world that promises prosperity, but often fails to deliver. I was so taken with this insight that I called my parents to tell them I would not be returning home to take eventual responsibility for the family business. I had decided to devote my life to ending poverty. I would go to Africa, Asia, and Latin America to share the secrets of U.S. success as a middle-class democracy with a capitalist economy. It was a moment when the middle class was thriving in the United States, and I was more than a little naive. Well, basically, I lost my innocence. The actual consequence of the so-called economic development that I observed in Africa, Latin America, and Asia was extreme and growing inequality, decimation of the middle class, and disruption of Earth's capacity to sustain life. The drivers of the devastation were not community-owned businesses like my father's. 
They were global corporations devoted to the exploitation of people and nature to grow already obscenely large fortunes at the expense of democracy, the middle class, and the well-being of people and earth. I had been deceived by fraudulent economics, as had most of the world. so-called developed countries would not be where they were if it wasn't for free labor, free resources, and so on, so on, so on, that they took from countries like Namibia, you know, and many others across the world. So we need to all acknowledge that aid is not coming from the Western world to Africa. It never has, never. Aid is coming from Africa to the Western world. The Western world would not be able to survive not even a year without Africa. It was in the late 1980s, I was becoming ever more conscious of the basic premise of the development economists who shaped the policies of the International Monetary Fund the World Bank, and other international development agencies. They viewed the world through a financial lens that allowed them to see only flows and pools of money. So they considered the labor of people who meet their own needs directly with no need for an exchange of money, for example, by growing their own food, to be economically irrelevant. But wait, the purpose of the economy is not to make money, it is to meet people's needs. <laughs> At least that's what most of us think. I vividly recall a meeting with a group of Harvard development economists discussing the Korean development miracle. They reported that Korean agriculture makes no consequential contribution to Korean development because it only feeds the Korean people. That seemed a bit odd. Farmers who work their own land to feed their families might be well-fed, happy, and healthy, but within a limited perspective of a development economist, they contribute nothing to GDP, and because they have little income, they are classified as living in absolute poverty. But you remove that farmer from the land, family, and community, put him or her to work for a pittance in a sweatshop or on a corporate farm, and you've developed the economy. A development economist will applaud the increase in GDP and credit economic development with lifting one more person from absolute poverty. This is the obscenity that characterizes much of what conventional economists consider economic success. How can these money numbers put an intelligent species on a suicidal path to self-extinction? I assure you, I have given that question a lot of thought. It actually became something of an obsession for me back in November 1992, when I participated with leaders of six major Asian non-governmental organizations in a 10-day retreat in Baguio, a mountain resort in the Philippines. We had all worked together for several years and shared a belief that the so-called Asian development miracle then much touted by the World Bank and free market economists was more illusion than reality. Beneath the surface appearance of dynamic competitive economies in South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore was a wider Asian reality of impoverishment and spreading disruption of the region's social and ecological foundations. We noted that economic development was monetizing relationships once based on a sense of mutual caring and obligation between people and between people and the land on which their livelihoods had depended for many thousands of years. One evening as we gathered after dinner to continue our discussion, an image emerged reminiscent of the classical horror movie, The Blob. It was a vision of money spreading out across the Asian countryside, consuming life to grow money everywhere it touched. But how could that be? Money's just a number. It has meaning only in the human mind. 
It has no substance, no body, no awareness, no will. It seems to be driven to consume life, to reproduce itself. Wow. I puzzled on this for days. And eventually the answer hit me. We have created a world in which money has become our means of access to everything we need and want. Water, food, a place to live, entertainment, even love. What could be more valuable than money? And yet it is ephemeral. If you're a financial trader speculating on financial bubbles, it can appear or disappear in an instant. You can never be sure you have enough. Furthermore, it will buy only that which already exists and is available for purchase. It's worthless if you're stranded on a desert island, and it will be worthless on a dead earth. Our problem resides not in the numbers we call money. It resides in the power of those who possess those numbers over those who do not. That power has so focused our attention on growing and acquiring those numbers that we fail to care for that on which our well-being, indeed our existence, depends. The air, the waters, the soil, the trees, the bees, even the microbes in our gut, and one another. We rarely ask, where does my food come from? Who does the work of growing, harvesting, and getting my food to me? Who keeps the soil healthy? Are there owners who just collect rent along the way while providing no actual service? Who gets the greater reward? The workers or the rentiers? Now, if you control access to land, water, and money, you rule the world. That control, that power to rule the world is concentrating in the hands of ever fewer people who are extracting ever more profit while providing ever less in return. Consequently, life is getting ever harder for ever more people on a dying earth. If this pattern continues, ultimately, there will be no survivors. This is the path of the love of money, the path to human self-extinction. I was beginning to see this basic truth when in 1991, I visited in India with Smithu Kutari, a leading Indian intellectual and activist who has now passed. Smithu had become a close friend and colleague I mentioned to him that Fran and I had come to so love Asia that we were thinking of spending the rest of our lives there. And he responded, you and Fran came here from the United States to help us, and we appreciate that. But you have since learned what our real problem is. If you really want to help us, now you need to return home and share what you have learned here with other Americans. Wow. Smithu's message hit home. In 1992, Fran and I returned to the United States and settled in New York City in an apartment near Union Square between Wall Street and Madison Avenue. Once back home, I began to see the same forces that were devastating lives in Asia, Africa, and Latin America were also devastating lives in the United States and elsewhere in the so-called developed world. The United States has never been a middle-class democracy. It was launched as an aristocracy of white male owners of land stolen from Native Americans and worked by slaves and underpaid laborers to whom the system gave few or no options. The book I had returned to the United States to write became When Corporations Rule the World. Launched at the precise moment that many people around the world were awakening to the dangers of corporate power, that book became an international bestseller, translated into numerous languages. Amazingly, 69 
of the world's 100 largest economies are transnational corporations. And those transnational corporations have just the, the ultimate reason for their being is simply to grow, grow value for their shareholders, which means consuming the earth at an ever faster pace and basically turning human beings into zombie consumers. So this story, of course, as we all know so well, has led to what's now the greatest inequality in history, where the most recent statistics are that now the wealthiest 26 billionaires own as much wealth as the entire half of the world's entire population. Government is not the problem. The problem is a failed system that leaves us overly dependent on intrusive government to limit the abuse of corporate power and to clean up the messes such abuse creates. The goal is not to regulate profit-maximizing monopolies, it is to eliminate them. The goal is a world in which every business is owned by people who depend on it for their means of living. The system we seek will minimize the need for people to turn to government to save them from the hardships imposed by the failed system of business under which we now live. In 1997, a slight woman of apparent Chinese ancestry approached me at an international conference. She introduced herself as Dr. Mei Wan Ho. She said, my work may be relevant to your work. The reason I went into university was because I wanted to know, literally, what life means, what makes life. That was my burning question. I was a molecular geneticist until I found out that it was just the same old reductionist science, and it wasn't going to tell me what life was about. I like to understand nature as a romantic poet, as well as a scientist and artist. Mei Wan went on to point out that the human body, this vessel of our consciousness and vehicle of our agency, is a higher order community of tens of trillions of interdependent, regenerating, decision-making living cells and microorganisms engaged in a continuing self-managed exchange of nutrients, water, energy, and information. Now, it's all rather obvious when pointed out but I'd never heard it put that way before. And it turns out actually that neither had most biologists. I was fascinated. Mei Wan took me ever deeper into a recognition of life's essential features. It was for me a truly mind altering experience. I have never since seen the world in quite the same way. The exchanges between our body cells are mediated by our heart, lungs, liver, brain, and other organs, which are themselves communities of living beings. Each of these cells is itself continuously regenerating through life's eternal cycles of death and birth and rebirth. Yet, at the same time, each is performing its essential duties in relationship to the whole of my body. And of course, a functioning body is not self-contained. It depends on my body's continuing exchange with a larger community of life on which I depend for food, water, air, a stable climate, waste recycling, and companionship. I exist because the bees pollinate, the trees produce oxygen, the beetles decompose soil, the microbes digest the food in my gut and recycle my waste. And there are people who love and care for me as I love and care for them. All levels in the community of life are continuously regenerating through distinctive cycles of birth, life, and death, continuously adapting, learning, and evolving together. Ultimately, we get to the living Earth, a planet that over billions of years has learned to create and maintain the distinctive surface conditions on which all of life as we know it depends. Now, life clearly involves competition with deadly consequences for select individuals, but look beneath the surface and you find extraordinary cooperation, which many of our ancestors recognized even without the aid of the scientific instruments now available to us.
the mother continent, nature, which is our mother, taught us how to be human. And nature is, is interconnected, interrelated, and interdependent. Ubuntu is, is a way of life where spiritual, mental, emotional, physical are connected. The core values of Ubuntu, self-respect, respect for others, reverence for nature and reciprocity to know that you cannot live alone as we say in my language um to ungum to a person's personhood is only meaningful if it is affirmed by others ubuntu which translates I am because you are. This one word, it takes five in English, wondrously summarizes the implications of the complex reality that contemporary science now confirms. Caring for one another and nature is not only a sound ethical principle, it is the essential foundation of our existence. Humanity's current crisis is a consequence of forgetting what our earliest ancestors learned and understood from their daily experience. Ubuntu, I am because you are. All of you, the whole of life. That means that my well being depends on your well being. Therefore, it is in the interest of each of us to cooperate to increase the well being of all. Once you begin viewing life as deeply cooperative rather than brutally competitive, it shines a wholly new light on the human experience in relation to our human possibility. I began exploring the implications along with a great many wonderful colleagues leading up to the publication of The Great Turning in 2006. That book's focus is on humanity's most recent 5,000 years what we might call the imperial era. It is the era when the most uncivil among us gained the power to declare themselves civilized and declare those they sought to dominate as uncivilized. The great turning from empire to earth community brought together the insights emerging from the many discussions in which I was then involved to frame a vision of human possibility what we now call an ecological civilization. Got to build the alternatives, the new ways of doing things, the new institutions. And these, I am telling you, they are sprouting up now at a phenomenal rate. Probably there has been no time in human history where so many new ways of doing things and old is reaching back before the industrial growth society into old wisdom, earth wisdom traditions, and indigenous wisdom. There's probably no time in human history where these new ways have sprouted so fast. And I, I say sprouted, I see them coming up like sprouts amidst the rubble of a dysfunctional civilization. So a few years ago, I tried to draw a picture because I love drawing pictures. I tried to draw a picture of the world that we want to live in and it Silly though it sounds, it came out looking like a donut. So imagine a donut, there's the outside and then there's the inside and there's that hole in the middle. In the hole in the middle, that's a space of deprivation, a space of shortfall where people don't have the resources to meet the essentials of life, like they don't have enough food or education, they don't have access to electricity, enough income, they don't have decent housing. So it's a space of shortfall and we want to get people out of that hole in the middle into the donut. But we want to do that for the whole world making sure that we also don't go beyond the donut's outer crust because that's a space of ecological overshoot where humanity puts more pressure on the planet than the planet can take and we start causing climate change or massive loss of biodiversity. We start 
creating a hole in the ozone layer or polluting Earth with chemicals that we add to it. So we need to both get people out of deprivation and poverty, but also protect Earth and protect these fundamental life-supporting systems that keep us alive. Those are the two sides of human well-being, the inside and the outside of the donut. And the 21st century challenge is a unique one. It's to get everybody out of poverty while coming back in at the same time. That's never been taken on before. And that's partly why we need to rewrite economics, because it's a completely new way of looking at what human well-being is. You have to have a vision of a different kind of economy, a vision of an economy that by its very nature delivers uh, sustainability and broad-based prosperity. We use the phrase community wealth building, which is a broad umbrella that says, let's build community wealth as the purpose of economic activity and economic development. And within that, you have social enterprise, you have employee ownership, you have locally owned banks or community development financial institutions. So the institutions are part of a broader framework, which says it's all aimed at building community wealth and the pieces work together. I mean, ownership structures, property and who holds it is at the foundation of every economy. So if we want a different kind of economy, we have to get the assets in different hands. That's fundamental. We are accustomed to turning to economics for mental images to guide us to mutual prosperity. But our current economics is not a true economics. It is an egonomics with four fatal flaws. It ignores the needs of life and evaluates our relationships and progress by purely financial metrics like growing GDP and financial assets. It accepts the concentration of power in monopolistic transnational corporations shielded from the moderating influence of market forces and far removed from community accountability. It assumes that competition rather than cooperation is our dominant human mode of relating. It ignores, even denies, our essential human responsibilities to one another and Earth. This egonomics is less a science than a religion devoted to the worship and love of money. It bears major responsibility for our current crisis. It cannot lead us out of the crisis for which it bears major responsibility. To reclaim our full humanity, we must liberate ourselves from the love of money. To guide us in that quest, we need a vision of a world devoted to the love of life, consistent with the teachings of the world's most revered religious teachers. The Ubuntu wisdom of our ancient ancestors at our current findings of science, economics is devoted to our love and care for life. It recognizes that one, life exists only in diverse communities of living beings that self-organize to create and maintain the conditions essential to their individual and collective well-being. Two, once our basic needs are met, true human happiness and well-being depends on being more, not having more. Three, the proper purpose of human institutions is to support us in relating to one another and nature in ways consistent with our long-term well-being. And four, we humans are by nature fundamentally cooperative beings who get our greatest satisfaction from being helpful to one another. The economics of an ecological civilization will be devoted to the study of the structures and management of all our major human institutions, religion, education, and government and business, and their distinctive roles and contributions to shaping our human choices. Remember my story about my dad, the businessman interrupting his dinner to get a customer a five cent guitar pick? That wasn't just a missing pick. This was so a neighbor could make his living bringing members of our community together to enjoy an evening of music. Dad's business was about making life better for his community, his family, and ultimately himself. 
We now seek new ways of living and being as caring communities devoted to life's well-being and continuing evolution within the larger scheme of creation's continued unfolding. Our future viability as a species depends on our ability to reshape our relationships with one another and Earth through ethically grounded choices relating to culture, institutions, technology, and infrastructure consistent with the well-being of all people and the living Earth that birthed and nurtures us. There is much pain ahead, yet an ultimately positive outcome is possible because the primary barriers reside only in the human mind. It is possible and it is consistent with our deeper human nature. We are living beings born to love and care for life. The time is now, the choice is ours for the love of life. Welcome back for further conversation with Dr. David Corton, where we hope to explore more deeply the great ideas and challenges raised by Dr. Corton in the film. And David, I'm going to ask a few questions of you and give you the full opportunity to provide answers because frankly, your life's work has such huge ideas mm -hmm. that address such huge challenges. So we would like this opportunity to understand your work as best as we can in this short period of time. And my first question to you, David, is building from the stories of your life in the video that we just watched, what do you consider to be the defining lessons essential for today's youth to understand and address as they confront the challenges of the world they are inheriting? That's a absolutely wonderful and timely question, Audrey. Uh, it starts with a recognition that we humans are creatures of the mind. We live by the stories by which we self-define our human nature and purpose. Now, if we get our shared story right, we have the potential to find joy and security together. But if we get that story wrong, we can get our institutions terribly wrong and become a deadly threat to Earth and to ourselves, which our current experience demonstrates. We're currently awakening as a now closely interconnected and interdependent global species to a deeply distressing reality. We have our institutions badly wrong because of a badly flawed story that embraces three illusions. The wealth illusion, the illusion of economic progress, and the illusion that institutions dedicated to growing the fortunes and power of the already obscenely rich are legitimate. So let's start with the wealth illusion. The illusion that money is wealth and the ticket to our human well being and happiness. Recall my fascination in the video with the horror movie, The Blob. The image of money spreading out across the earth, consuming everything it touches to grow itself. Am I puzzling over the question of how can money? a mere number with no meaning beyond the human mind, how could it become an animate force? Money clearly has no will or capacity for action. It is not and cannot become an animate force. But we humans demonstrate that we can become such a force on money's behalf 
if our brains embrace the illusion that money is wealth and the ticket to our well-being and happiness. We're victims of a potentially fatal self-inflicted deception born of the false belief that money is wealth and that the more we have, the more extravagantly we can live and the better off we will be. The illusion is affirmed by the experience of those who temporarily benefit from it. It is clearly, however, a temporary experience even for the very rich because their misguided excesses are killing the living earth on which we all depend. There will be no winners on a dead earth. Our self-created illusion has turned us into a moral threat to all of life, including ourselves. This wealth illusion is reinforced by the illusion of economic progress and the myth that economic growth is steadily improving the lives of all of Earth's people. The more fortunate humans, this includes myself and probably everyone who has the means to participate in this event. We don't have to be a billionaire to experience the previously unimaginable affluence and opportunity that the global economy currently makes possible for a few of us. Indeed, roughly 20% of the world's people currently live quite well, especially in comparison to the poorest 50%. National governments ruled by the affluent have become very good at hiding the reality behind the wealth and progress illusions. Some years ago, I observed the governments of Indonesia and Thailand walling off their slums so that foreign delegates to international conferences saw only affluent areas of their capital cities, never the slums. The larger picture is that for most of all the world's people, life is now less secure and happy than the typical experience of our pre-development ancestors. What we have yet to fully grasp is the evidence that a majority of the world's people are currently experiencing declining life expectancy, growing desperation, and a decline in relationships that offer some semblance of security. Relevant statistics are limited, but the evidence is accumulating. Though the economy continues to grow, total well being is declining. The distressing portion of today's people experience lives that are less meaningful, enjoyable, and secure than the lives of our ancient ancestors. Our growing population of the excluded includes the homeless, the refugees desperately seeking to escape from violence and environmental collapse, prisoners, including the unjustly confined, itinerant agricultural and sweatshop workers separated by thousands of miles from home and family, and massive populations of slum dwellers struggling to survive amongst filth, violence, and deadly pollution. It's a problem that as individuals, we can do little to address. We can only address it together. Even among us more fortunate, alarming numbers are experiencing a dehumanizing growth of single family homes as families and communities disintegrate. Along with our ability to care for our children, our aging elders and friends and family experiencing physical and mental distress. Solutions do not require returning to the ways of our ancient ancestors. We must recognize, however, that many of these ancestors had more meaningful and fulfilling lives than what many of our fellow humans currently experience. We have the current means to create a world that provides a secure and meaningful life for all, but only if we work together to create it.
So, uh, David, thank you so much for this very deep discussion on the illusions. And I wanted you to address a third illusion uh, that you talked about previously, and that's the illusion of institutional legitimacy of the profit-maximizing uh, corporation. So share with us more about that. Yeah, the um, excellent question, Audrey. And here, there's there's an obvious but rarely recognized answer. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, the days of my initial experience in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, most of the world's people still lived directly from the land with the help of their neighbors. They had no need for money. There was competition and violence, but in most cultures, these were exceptions to everyday experience of mutual love, care, and cooperation. Now, only a few decades later, nearly everyone needs money to access their means of living, and many of our exchanges are mediated by profit-maximizing transnational corporations. This has resulted in a profound shift in how we see the world. We've scarcely begun to recognize the implications, let alone address them. Now, even if we could eliminate money and corporations with a simple wave of the hand, that alone would not solve our problem. We would still need to restore love and caring as our primary mode of relating to earth and one another. Within the complex web of life, this involves learning and understanding far beyond simply feeling warm thoughts and good wishes. The first step in correcting our error is to get our minds around the nature and seriousness of the challenge we have created for ourselves. During my years of living abroad, especially in the mid-1960s when Fran and I were living in Ethiopia, I traveled in some very remote areas, taking what I now look back on as foolish, foolish risks. For example, Fran and I took one trip in our Land Rover through southern Ethiopia, during which we traveled for some three days, literally without ever seeing another car. And this, of course, was before cell phones. These were people who lived virtually with no contact with the modern world. We had no means of communication with family or colleagues and no backup plan. Yet we were confident that if our car broke down or we had some other serious problem, someone among the local people would care enough and find the means to help us get back home. Yes, there were tricksters and thieves in that world, but most people in the world we were getting to know were ready to lend a helping hand with a stranger in need. This seemed to be especially true for the very poor. My experience tells me that caring for one another is our true human nature. Fran and I returned to the United States in 1996. That was more than 25 years ago. This world is now far more crowded with far more people living in desperation, seeking a place of refuge in a world of increasing chaos in which places of refuge are rapidly disappearing. Our common future depends on deep and rapid transformation. Well, thank you, David. You know, an important insight and a very profound challenge that I sense is related to your observation in your recent newsletter regarding our human relationship to Earth's comments. And specifically in that newsletter, you noted that no human had any role in creating the living Earth comments that gave birth to humans and on which we all depend for a stable climate, uh, clean water, uh, air, and food. And you suggest that no human has a right to own more of that comments, the earth's land, air, water, and soil, than required to meet their essential material needs. Can you say more about that? 
Yeah, that is such an important issue. And it starts with our recognition that life exists only in communities that self-organize to create and maintain the conditions essential to their own existence. Over millions of years, literally millions of years, the living earth created the conditions essential to the emergence of the human species. We had no part in creating that world, that commons, yet we all depend on it. We can do it serious harm. We have an inherent responsibility to care for it. None of us has a right to monopolize or attempt to control it. Because we cannot live without it, care for Earth must be our first human priority. Our second priority must be the well-being of all of Earth's people. Simply stated, we must facilitate Earth's healing and assure that its gifts are equitably shared in support of life's continued evolutionary unfolding. To achieve this, our human institutions must serve us, which brings us to our third priority, aligning our institutions behind the well-being of Earth and all its people. Human societies must support every person in meeting their essential material needs in ways that are satisfying to themselves while contributing to the well-being of the whole. Our current institutions, led by profit-maximizing transnational corporations, reward us for maximizing growth in our personal financial assets. Because this ultimately does not serve either ourselves or humanity, we have the imperative, the right, and the means to eliminate or change them, beginning with the institutions of military and financial rule that bear major responsibility for our potentially terminal human crisis. This is the defining current challenge that must unite us globally. Well, David, you know, there's so much rethinking that you have really posed as us as individuals as well, um, as a challenge, and there's so many needs. And please share with us, what is your guidance for those who are asking, what can I do to advance the transition to an ecological civilization? Well, in short, there is no one answer to that question. The transition to an ecological civilization and a viable human future will require transformation in nearly every aspect of life. No one of us can do it alone. But fortunately, we are a diverse people with many skills and interests. We each have our distinctive place and contribution. So anything that builds community while healing Earth and meeting the essential needs of people and nature will likely help. The best answers will move us from the pursuit of money to the restoration of caring, loving relationships, reconnecting us with one another while reducing our human burden on Earth. If those relationships involve money, that money will circulate locally and support local ownership, local cooperative ownership. In finding our personal place, we must each consider our distinctive skills, interests, relationships, and where we are in our life experience. In my personal case, I've long been focused on changing the story that drives our behavior as a now interconnected global species. That is still my priority, but I no longer focus on sharing my thoughts on the new story by writing books and speaking to large audiences. My current priority is working with younger thought leaders who will be around after my passing to carry on the work. Now I'm now 85. So for me, younger doesn't just mean folks in their 20s or 30s, though they certainly count, <laughs> extremely important. But it also, the younger population also includes 60 and 70 year olds. You may not think of them as young, but you know, <laughs> it all is relative. So Audrey, with that, I suggest maybe we turn to uh, questions from our audience. 
Thank you so much, David, for going more deeply into the points that you raised in the film. It's, it's very instructive and informative for all of us. And thank you for mentioning the 60 and 70 year olds as young, because after all, uh, that is supposedly the new middle age. So we actually <laughs> get younger and younger. <laughs> so let's turn to some questions from the audience. And there's a first question uh, that is asking you, uh, what gives you hope that our world is genuinely making this great turning? Yeah, that's a, a, another excellent question. Um, you know, my discussion of Mei Wan Ho and her insights that I got in the late 1990s, now it wasn't very long ago. But what we have since seen since the, the beginning of this century um, and, and this millennia, only 20, 23, year, 23 years ago, is a fundamental shift in biology and the thinking of science into a much deeper understanding of the complexity of life the recognition that life is alive and it is interdependent and it is fundamentally in so many powerful ways, uh, fundamentally cooperative. So I see hope in that. Um, I also see hope as some of our speakers mentioned in the, in the video, that every place we turn, we see people organizing, starting new initiatives and so forth in their communities. Uh, in their global discussion groups and so forth, beginning to ask deep questions and beginning to um, beginning to work on these aspects of deep change on which a viable human future depends. Um, it cannot happen fast enough. I mean, the we are we are in a time of crisis. We have. Basically, by the end of this decade, science tells us, you know, we, we, we don't have to have solved the problem by then, but we absolutely have to have changed direction and be on a fundamentally new path based on a fundamentally new understanding of what life is about and the, 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 the nature and positioning of, of humans within the larger, um, the larger human enterprise. So thank you, David. Um, as a follow-up, you know, the next question really, again, addresses what can we as individuals within the totality of the whole do to take steps towards this new world? So what do you recommend for individuals to do? Well, again, that comes back to, it depends on who you are, what your skills are, uh, what positions of influence you have. Those may be large international fora like the one we're speaking in, or they may be groups within your community. They may be, they may be a neighbor, they may be your, your local church. Um, but the key thing, at least in my mind, is that since everything must change, there are no simple answers to that. I, I cannot tell you what you should do be, unless I know you and know your connections and your possibilities. Uh, and so this is partly recognizing the complexity of what we must achieve, while at the same time recognizing the um, recognizing that basically everything has to change how we uh, how we grow our food how we uh, arrange our diets um, but I think you know I think one of the most important things we have to keep in mind I'm very serious about this development of, of single person households and the breakdown I mean so many people now are reduced to jobs where they're running from one job to another and they have no time to spend either with their children or with their neighbors um, you know this is all part of this breakdown of relationships of caring and interacting and we absolutely the the, the, the survive our survival our transformation depends on reestablishing these relationships of caring and mutual help. 
I mean, I think of my wife. I mean, one of her, she's working in so many initiatives with the with the local community, the people we live with, to uh, try to get us beyond um, beyond the use of carbon fuels, of, of creating pathways and so forth, so that we can move around Bainbridge Island uh, more by bicycle and less by by car. Um, you know, these are all things that tie in with our, our local community and they are distinctive to what we have capabilities to work on. Uh, they are distinctive to the needs that our community has, but the powerful ones are all ones that are changing how our possibilities for actually working together and getting behind, getting beyond this, this isolation that uh, we have, we, we find ourselves moving into. You know, David, don't you think it's kind of ironic? I mean, uh, back in the old days, people had bicycles and they walked. And yes. then, you know, we had this big push for automobiles. And, and now it seems to be changing where we want people to be able to uh, walk again and, you know, get exercise and to return to bicycles to help, you know, alleviate the environmental pollution that's going on. And I think that has a lot to do with the illusions that you spoke so deeply about. And we have a question. You know, we have created a world where we need money, something that is not real in order to live. And as you point out, money is worthless on a dead earth. <laughs> but how can we liberate ourselves from our love of money? Can this dependency be reversed in our lifetime? What do you say to this questioner? Yeah, can it be reversed? Um... I don't know, but it has to be. <laughs> um, I mean, the first thing is to just recognize the need. That's the first step. We can't get beyond it unless we we recognize it. Now, I want I want to go actually go back on this question of uh, of of cars. Um, You know, when Fran and I moved back to the United States from the Philippines, we, we moved to New York City. And the years that we lived in New York City are the only time in our lives that we have lived totally without a car. And as I'm sure you've noticed, Audrey, if you're living in New York City, you've really got to be out of your mind to have a car. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, <laughs> they're a huge expense, and they basically don't get you any place. You're much better off with with public transit, or you know, we found most everything that we needed in daily life uh, we could obtain by walking from our apartment, and we loved it. It was a great way to live, um, and it is a better quality of life now. You know making people depend on cars is good for economic growth and all that kind of nonsense. But if we're talking about the best ways to live, creating communities where we interact with each other, every day in every way, meeting our, our daily normal needs, um, once we get into it, it, it is clearly a better way to live. And that, of course, is, is what we're eager to do here on Bainbridge is, is create this as an island where we have minimal need for cars and where most everything we do gives us opportunities to relate to our neighbors and to one another and kind of take care of each other. Um, so... Yeah, in terms of how do we get beyond money, uh, that's part of it. I mean, growing our own gardens, preparing our own food, having community kitchens, um, having co-housing units in which we uh, uh, we share appliances and share, share duties and so forth. Um, it, begins with the, it begins with asking the question, begins with a discussion. 
Well, thank you, David. Here's a fascinating question, you know, that really uh, should be explored because it's so important. It's representational of 50% of the world's population. And the questioner asks, I says, I noted that most of the other speakers in the film were women. Of course, there are probably many men who share your perspective. But do you think a woman's perspective makes them more sensitive to the issue of cha chasing money versus well-being? Well, you know, think of our history. Um, and here's where I, I hope you women can have a little sympathy for us men. You you think think of us as, as your exploiters. Um, but... You know, we've trained our men to go off to war, to fight and kill. You know, that's not really fun. <laughs> uh, that's not a good life. Um, we trained our women to care for the family and the household. Um, that, of course, is our current need to take care of family and household. So one, women, of course, are, to begin with, better equipped to do that, have the experience. Um, but it, it's so often the discussions sort of blame men, but, you know, we, we do what we were trained to do, what we were educated to do, what we were told culturally was our responsibility. Um, and now as we become a single integrated global species, um, well, I first, first let me confirm that, yes, um, in, in most of the work I do, the much of the leadership comes from women. Because, as, as you note, you are the, um, you are the gender of, of household, of caring, of family, and that is exactly our need. Um, and we men have to learn to find our own roles in contributing to that work. So all of these discussions and engagements around um, gender identity and fundamentally rethinking, but also, um, you know, we men need to recognize that much of the leadership is coming, must come from women in this transformation. So my thanks to the women, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very clear on that. It's not just in the movie, it is true in my own life as well. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you so much for that, uh, David, because, of course, it's uh, we cannot exclude 50% of the world's population. The gifts that they really bring to all of us and not fully incorporate them into these changes. They are, they are actually a change agents, powerful agents of transformation that we really have to incorporate at all levels of society. Now, uh, another question. What does history tell us about how empires lose their power? Uh, another very good question. Um, basically, by my understanding, they lose their power very much the way we are doing it now. They destroy their environment. They destroy their credibility with their own people because of the violence that they inflict on them. Um, so one thing that we can be sure of is the collapse of our existing empire. Now, of course, one of the things we need to recognize is that the dynamics of empire have shifted, that it used to be kings and emperors that were the uh, the the top-down authorities of, of the power structure of empire and exploitation. Now, as we have come in with our democratic institutions and limited the capacity of government, of the leaders of government to exercise that imperial authority, the institutional has structure has shifted from government to transnational corporations as the most powerful of human institutions. And it's extraordinary. Those, you know, they call themselves multinational, which makes it sound like they are national everywhere. Um, this, to me, is a total misnomer. Um, they are not multinational. They are transnational. They are, they do not embrace the needs 
or the will of any nation or its people. <laughs> um, they are institutions designed to maximize financial return to themselves. And increasingly, corporations, particularly publicly traded corporations, we have a system that if a corporation is not maximizing its profit, then you get private equity firms and other kinds of uh, financial predators buy them out, take them over, and restructure them to make sure that they are focused purely on making profits. Now, a lot of them have very good stories, and there are there are large businesses like Patagonia that are owned by a real human being who has a real commitment, as my dad did, to the idea that a business should serve the community. And these are, these are examples of our best businesses, but this is why it is so important that we break up corporate monopolies and restructure the pieces as worker or community-owned cooperative enterprises that are then accountable to their communities and that are clearly in business they, you know, every business has to make a profit to survive, but a, you know, an adequate profit is very different from a maximum profit. And the adequate profit is made in ways that are consistent with the needs and the well-being of the community and the workers and all the people who are engaged. Well, thank you, David. You know, you have posed some big ideas and big challenges. And so we have uh, many questions coming from the audience and also are big questions and may not be, uh, we don't of course have sufficient time to answer all of these wonderful questions. But here's one, what role does the government play in helping to change economic policies in the future? Ah. Uh. Yeah, that's a, a very good question because obviously the role of government is, is essential. But the question is, what is the government's role? What is its priority? And does the government manage itself to secure and strengthen the power of these rogue corporations? Or is the government's role to strengthen the ability of communities to control their own resources, to manage their own economies in ways that best use their resources to fulfill the needs of the community? So this is about supporting local community control power and ability to organize. Now within that new economy, self-reliance to the extent that it's feasible is, is a very good goal. That does not cut out global trade and global exchange because ultimately we are all interconnected and no community can meet all its needs totally on its own. But instead of shifting control over everything we do to the transnational corporations that then control all our interrelationships, we bring the power down to the community and um, that needs to be a defining role of, of governments, not central authorities, but supporters of local community self-organization to secure the well-being not necessarily the finance, the maximum financial resources of the community. Well, thank these, you so these much. These are all extremely, well, they're very simple in their essence, but they get very complicated when you get into the details of implementation. 
Well, well, thank you so much, David. And of course, the complexities seem to be growing because we have an unprecedented uh, 8 billion people in the world and we'll soon be climbing to nine. But mm -hmm. we um, have to wrap this up because I, this has been so rich. I mean, there's not enough time to answer all of the questions that are coming into the chat box and have come into the chat box. But I really want to thank you, David Corton. You know, you have really given our audience both in the film as well as in your comments today so much food for thought and this drive for wealth while it may have increased the wealth of some developing communities but overall it has been at the expense of the well-being of the people generally and especially the health of the environment which we are mindlessly exploiting and the business and development model of competition and exploitation to make money has been supported by what you have described as a flawed ideology that serves the short-term financial interest of billionaires and policies that have brought really unconscionable harm to people and the earth since the about mid 20th century. And although it's impossible to capture in a half hour film and in our conversation today, all of the really profound ideas that you have posed to all of us, I hope our audience has been moved to consider the state of our shared planet human well-being and the environment. And I hope that we will examine more carefully and deeply the wisdom of the concept of an ecological civilization. You know, the very deep and important message about the incredible connection of all living things at the cellular and spiritual levels conveys the importance importance of cooperation and collaboration instead of competition and power struggles to make more and more money. And I would like to acknowledge the talented and dedicated team at the International Academy for Multicultural Cooperation for helping to create this film. For everyone who wishes to see it again or share it with others, it's available on the International Academy for Multicultural Cooperation website's YouTube page, and the address will all, all be put in the chat box. And of course, David, I would like to express my deepest appreciation to you for dedicating so much time to help us create this film and for joining us today for this discussion. I would also like to thank your beautiful wife in work and in, you know, part, uh, partner, uh, life's partner, uh, Mrs. Fran Corton. You know, for the tremendous love, support, and belief that she's had all these years in your work and in your vision. Here's, we give a huge shout out to the power of women. And I really encourage everyone to read Dr. Corton's seminal best-selling book, When Corporations Rule the World. And you can visit to David's website at davidcorton.org to learn about how he sees the world and his vision for the future. So his website is being placed in the chat box, and there'll also be a photo of the book cover. And I close with these words from David Corton's article, Ecological Civilization the vision. And he says, we humans are living beings born of and nurtured by a living earth, itself born of and nurtured by a living universe, unfolding toward ever greater complexity, beauty, awareness, and possibility. Creation thus reveals its purpose, a quest to know itself and its possibilities through an epic journey of self-discovery through a process of eternal learning and becoming. Amen, David Corton. And with that, I thank David Corton and all of you for being with us today. And may you all have a very good day. Thank you, everyone.